Hello and welcome to another episode of the Tai Chi Notebook, the podcast about all things connected to Tai Chi. This month's guest is Richard Johnson, a long-time student of Joseph Chen of Chen Style Practical Method. As well as being a Tai Chi practitioner and teacher, Richard is a full-time movement coach working with athletes, so he brings an appreciation of athletic movement to his views on Tai Chi. In our discussion, Richard delves deeply into the internal workings of the Chen Style Practical Method, and we talk a lot about axes, fulcrums and leverage of a fixed point. We also talk about how Chen Style Practical Method is different to the Chen Style that comes from the Chen Village. So, let's jump right in. Here he is. Richard, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you, Graham? Um, I'm good. It's very wet and rainy here in um, Britain. It's a, it's a pretty dark October day, so I don't know what it's like in where you are. It's trying to decide. It's an autumn, so it's in transition. So it's mm. a little misty today, but the sun will probably be out later. Yeah, and uh, and it's afternoon for me, morning for you, of course, which is always a weird thing with these podcasts. Yeah. So we talk, We started talking because you were commenting on my, my blog post and I was impressed by the, the depth of your knowledge about all things to do with movement. And then it turns out that you're actually a professional sort of movement coach or, I don't know, therapist, what's the right word? Can you explain what it is that you do? So I started out, I was a massage therapist for about 20 years and then I decided to go back to graduate school in biomechanics and uh, ended up focusing on sports biomechanics mm-hmm. and someplace in the mix there I developed a kind of a therapy for people with uh, who are in pain with biomechanics with structural kinds of pains and then kind of combining working in Tai Chi I started working with some athletes at first changing postural irregularities and also kind of applying some of the uh, Tai Chi principles to uh, help them gain a competitive advantage. And that worked out with, uh, worked with several wrestlers, a couple of MMA people, a football player, well, a couple of football players, eh, some basketball players, which was different. Anyway, and then that, that just kind of developed into a business. So I was working on a PhD at Auburn University, but I ran out of time, money, and, and mm-hmm. desire to finish that. So I got all my coursework done, but I'm lacking my dissertation. So, yeah. Are you aimed primarily at athletes, or is it just regular people who've got some aches and pains? Uh, right now, primarily athletes. That's what I'm trying to get going. I've worked with people with aches and pains, but there are a lot of good people in that field. I have some unique offerings to offer athletes. Part of it's the, their biomechanics, if they have misalignments in their legs and stuff we can give them exercises that help work that out and so there's that aspect to getting their bodies to work work correctly and then there's stuff that kind of enhancing their ability based on uh, some of the stuff we learned from tai chi which of the tai chi principles do you find help athletes the most at first kind of a, a visualization understanding what their body's doing and then understanding what the their opponent's body is doing and as they learn that they get really fast so they don't have to like touch and figure it out they just like hit them and they know what it is that they're working with that first and then rotation it sounds and, a bit a bit less sort of push hands like is that yeah push hand, push hands it's all kind of push, push hands based okay right yeah i'm with you yeah we're not trying to uh break bones or no no depends what sport you're playing but most of them don't yeah right not intense bones do they (laughs) you mentioned rotation there this is one of the interesting theories that um, you've expounded a few times which is i think it comes from the chen style practical method you you train which is rotating around fixed points do you want to just elaborate on that a little let's approach it from biomechanics rotation is essentially a a lever and so if you have a a lever with its uh, axis or its fulcrum point moving, mm-hmm. you don't get power out of that lever. So, but if you fix that that fulcrum, then you get a lot of power from your lever. And the same is, is it goes with rotation. You get more power if you have that fixed point, fixed rotation point. 
And so it, it can be fixed in a couple of different ways. You know, you get into physics, you start looking at frames of reference. And so it can be look like it's moving in this frame of reference, but as long as it's fixed in the correct frame of reference in which it needs to be applied, then you get a lot of power going through that rotation. I focused on this a little bit because I think it's one of the mo more basic things that were kind of missing in Tai Chi in general. There's a phrase from the um, classics, when one part of the body moves, the whole body moves. And I think that's taken out of context most of the time and really means something else than it does in English. Mm -hmm. I've looked at the Chinese, it, and it appears to be when one part of the body moves, the whole body moves. But I would say when one part of the body moves, the whole body is connected with that movement would be a better uh, thing, not the whole body moves together. One of the things that one of the bases of Tai Chi is when you when you you have to separate into a yin and yang. And so if you're moving to the left, part of you needs to be moving to the right to to have that yin and yang. If you're all moving to the left, you're all whatever whatever that is, you know, it's all left. You're not getting this balance of forces. And so and to do that you usually have to, you can have a linear split, but you have to, uh, the, one of the easier w ways to do that is through rotation. One part of it's going up, one part's going down, one part forward, and one part's going back. Can you give so, a, like a, an example of uh, like a, a movement or an application that would involve that rotation? Everything. <laughs> everything, yeah. Um, uh, pick me, pick, pick a... Oh, just ward off from the... Ward off, that, okay. Yeah, the simple, okay. everyone knows ward off, right? So, yeah, everyone knows ward off, but everyone, uh, someone told me one time to, to that it should be kind of like a snowplow. And that's not separating yin and yang. And so when you touch your opponent and they press back, then you rotate. You can rotate your arm on, the, on a longitudinal axis. That does some things. You can rotate it on a, a, a lateral axis, and that does other things. So and so, you want you're responding to you you respond to their resistance. If they resist one or if they resist one place, that goes toward you, and then you rotate away the rest of that limb or your whole body, whatever it has to be, to rotate away from that. So that they're pushing in and you and you are pushing out. One of Master Chen's students of, that I f first met, first, first night I met them, he said, we never give up real estate, but we'll trade real estate all day long. That's a, the way he conceptualized it. I guess that's a, verb, a good way to verbalize it. As a, an opponent pushes in, we take back that real estate that we've given in another place. So that, that that's usually done with rotation. There are, there are ways to linearly split that, but that's usually the, the easier way to do it. Yeah, so the way I understood that was, it, say I held my hand out and somebody pushed on it, I wouldn't let my hand withdraw towards me because that would be giving up real estate. I would form a fixed point on the contact, perhaps, and rotate. So as they push in, I'm rotating around that point and it's pushing them further up on their arm. Yeah, you can you can actually. So if they if there's a contact point, let's say they're pushing primarily with their index and middle fingers and thumb, you can actually split their hand, and as that comes in, then you rotate and it pushes back with the little finger and ring finger. If they push in with the top of their hand, you can rotate and come back on their palm. Yeah, interesting you mentioned the hands because I, I trained this style of Tai Chi once that's unheard of in America, but it's big in Britain. It's called Lee style, and it's not the one that you typically hear called Lee, which is rated to Wu style. It's a, it's a, it's a separate one that has a slightly dubious lineage, but one of their things was, say someone punched towards you or pushed towards you with their fist, you contact them with your thumb edge, on their arm and that becomes like a fixed point around which you 
rotate your wrist and it sort of draws them in while I'm balancing them. Yeah. Uh, that sounds very similar to that would be similar. Yeah. What you're saying, yeah. Yeah. I'm not yeah. I'm not withdrawing as I contact, I'm not letting my hand come towards me. I'm sort of keeping it still and rotating. But they had but, a thing about rotating around the thumb. That was just the way they did it. You know, that was yeah. their their sort of yeah. point. And Chen and Chen style can be any finger. So yeah, I, I guess, like, I mean, I guess the thumb was just what, how you learned it, but yeah, sure. The, the theory, yeah. I guess, the theory, you know, if, as long as you make a point and you rotate around it, it doesn't really matter which point it is, does right. it? Exactly. And and then you can, Shifu uh, Chen Zhong Hua told, uh, shows a lot of times pushing at the chest, someone pushing at your, at your chest, and you give that up, and then you stretch down with like with your feet. This can be whole body, mm. it can. The um, left, right on the body. It can be in your hands. It can be in your arms. It's described in a couple of ways in the classics. It's splitting, but it, but also rotation. Okay, well that makes sense. So that's rotation. What are the other principles in Chen style practical method that we we need to talk about? Frankly, if you master splitting, you've got most <laughs> part. Uh, <laughs> it's a challenge. Uh, there are other things. The idea of yin and yang. So. Um, uh, Master Chen talks about a dot or a point, and then stretching away from that point and keeping that point stationary. That becomes important too, especially as you start establishing the axes of rotation, because you want to and moving on that, staying on that line, moving on that line, rotating around that line. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Let's see. Uh, we we also talked about bringing someone to the edge of the cliff. And so you step in, I mean, you, you actually, you break their root when you step in and you hold them there. They're teeter tottering on the edge of the cliff. And then you, you either let them fall off, you push them off, whatever you want to do with that. Mm -hmm. And that's similar. It's just a a matter of feeling it and figuring out where it is. And stepping has a lot, that's more with stepping method. As anything the rotation method obviously it, it requires the the opponent there to to know what you're rotating but how i'm just wondering how you train it in your solo form ah, yeah so this is uh, this the the dreaded silk re- re- reeling the silk <laughs> reading yes the yeah. reeling energy uh we call it we just call it basics training and mm. because you you learn to rotate um uh the 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 basic one we start with is twisting towel, twisting the towel where you are moving back and forth using kind of a vertical axis through your torso and mm-hmm. back and forth. And at first you don't even rotate the arms, but then you need you recognize that as you move, it causes your arms to rotate. You get used to that rotation and there are variations on that at different a couple of variations. One gets going diagonally through the body. And so you learn to, to diagonally rotate through your entire body. It teaches you how to use your pelvis. And you um, recently wrote about the claw. And, yeah, today, and, in fact. <laughs> yeah, you posted that today, yeah. And it teaches you, you to use the claw. And you realize that the claw is... Your pelvis is is rotating in. There's a qua, okay, and you you're using that, but then you're also using the pelvis with the qua, and so it it rotates in six different uh, around three different axes in six different directions. Yeah, so, I've heard that described as being like an egg cup. So you, <clears throat> you sort of have a massive egg cup in your like abdomen, which is like the pelvis, and then you can angle yeah. it. Or a bowl, yeah. And it gets yeah, a basin, bowl. yeah, right. Yeah, so that's an angle, and it can angle within the hips. So it can sort of turn a bit within the hip frame. Yeah, and one of the important parts for, for rooting and stuff and not double weighting and, and things like that is to get the, I guess, the, the energy of one, one pelvis going down while the energy of the other pelvis comes up. And so that causes splitting in the body and, and in the stance and keeps you from uh, double weighting so that like if your opponent pushes into your rear leg, you don't also want to be pushing into your rear leg because that's double weighting into that leg. 
And so you want to be switching to the other leg. Um, and there are other things that you can do, but there, that that forms the basis of staying balanced because then that kind of neutralizes its push because you're not, you're not in no danger of being pushed over anymore because mm. you balanced it by sinking into the other leg. Yeah, I, that makes sense as double weighting as I understand it as well, which is yeah. nothing to do with having your weight equal. It's it's more to do with like if someone's pushing on one side, you don't want to make that side heavy. You want to you, you want to sort of empty that side and fill the other side. Then your sort of yin yang balances out rather than being all in one place, which is when you get pushed over. If you right, if I put, if I put my weight into the thing that you're pushing on, I'm kind of right. giving you something to push on, right? It helps him push it, push it. It, it fixes it so that he's got uh, leverage on it. Yes, yeah. Leverage is an interesting word as well because obviously I do jujitsu a lot, and leverage is the thing we talk about. When we talk jujitsu, right? Like, we don't talk jujitsu very much. We just do it. It's <laughs> it's it's kind of the opposite of the tai chi world, where people mainly seem to talk about it and not do it. And then... we uh, we try not to do much <laughs> tai chi. We just try. To... <laughs> yeah. Only, you know, in, in day long seminars, you end up with a lot because it's so exhausting. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But in uh in like an hour 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 and a half class, we try to. Not do much talking. Yeah, it's hard though in Tai Chi, I find, because people always want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I I really try to avoid that with uh, with students. Um, I've fallen to into that trap. I find it's unproductive. It's the the hands on is much more productive than the than the talking about it. Yeah, and also I think when you talk about it, you can convince yourself that you've done it. This <laughs> is the other you, right. You, you kind of get that dopamine hit of having done something when you haven't actually done anything you just talked about it you know <laughs> yeah that's a good point yeah yeah um but yeah we so we, t- we when when we talk in jiu-jitsu we talk about leverage um quite a lot as, as being the kind of the big thing and really i mean i i guess in a way what we're talking about is rotation because like you say if you move your point of leverage around there is no leverage you kind of have to put it somewhere for there to be leverage to exist, you know? Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's one of the things that in graduate school, I, we were work, my uh, primary advisor was working with pitchers. And so I did a lot of number crunching on pitchers. And one of the things that I prior research had found is that there's really only two phases during the pitch that generate power. And one is the step. So you, that, that there's that big step and they step down and get their body accelerating forward. Mm. But then that has to, but that stops or mm. their shoulder, their shoulder. Uh, uh, I know it's there. Uh, I'm sorry. And I'm saying the step, but in the step, it's the rotation of the body mm. that creates the, the power. And then as they, as a step that actually kind of gets fixed. And then their shoulder gets fixed and they, as the shoulder doesn't actually create that much power, it becomes the, the, um, the wrist flip on their release where the, as I remember correctly, that's where the power is created. So those rotations, but as each one transfers to the other, it stops, it stops. And then there's further rotation. So one rotates. It quits rotating, and then the other one uh, rotates. It's a uh, it's an interesting uh, it's interesting to watch three D stick models uh, in slow motion. You know, uh, doing mm. that, and so that's uh, batters do the same thing. Batter both in uh, baseball and cricket. They yeah. still cricket. I understand that. Yeah, they. You think it's moving? You go, oh yeah, that's just a nice smooth move. But that's that point where it's they go to make contact. There is a point around which everything is rotating as it, it, to get a powerful, the people that have a powerful hit or uh, um, whatever. <laughs> you know, if you're making a line drive or out into the outfield or whatever, you, there's this, that power has to re- revolve around that fixed point. Access is still. If it's moving, you just don't have the leverage. It's interesting because I, I haven't really 
until I started talking to you, I haven't really thought about this in relation to to Tai Chi. But like you said, it's the, it's the thing that you think is missing the most, right? Yeah, I think it's the thing. I I think we're losing Tai Chi. I think we're losing the skills of Tai Chi. I, I think that it, they're becoming dispersed and uh, among the different styles because we focus on, on, I don't know, differences or whatever instead of trying to appreciate the value of what, what e- everyone else has. Hmm. That we're starting to really lose the the knowledge base for Tai Chi. I have, you know, I've seen a lot of Master Fong died. He was a part of my lineage and um, a few years ago, and he didn't, I don't think he communicated more than just a little bit of what, what he had, his lifetime of learning was, mm-hmm. you know, so we're, we're, we're losing older masters and we're losing, and then the people um, coming up, there are very, very few who get, who are really high skilled and, or who work hard enough to become high skilled. And so we're starting to lose it and we need to, uh, we need to kind of break down our, get rid of our tribalism and our competitive and open up or we're going to lose the whole thing. So what would you put that down to the reason we're losing it then? I think we've been losing it for a long time in that, you know, Tai Chi developed in a pretty violent society, a dangerous, you know, and so you know, whether it developed in the Chen village or whether it developed, you know, wh- whatever your theory is on how it developed, it developed to pre- prepare people to to defend the village and, and not bear hands with weapons or to, to go to war. And a lot of people, while Yang Lu Chen was in Beijing, a lot of the Chen uh, masters were fighting in the Taiping Rebellion, fighting against the Taiping Rebellion. And there are a number of them... Uh, were killed and so you get just kind of a so you get a die off you get a big die off during world war ii when the um when the village itself was all uh, you know evacuated and then after the japanese left people came back in but the number of practitioners was decimated so you get that kind of thing going on but then in transmission you get kind of imperfect transmission imperfect transmissions so if you have you know, five great crews and you have three of them, you, then you've lost those two. But maybe some other style has those, has preserved those two. And so, you, you know, if we can kind of combine our commonalities and, and look at the places where, where we're different instead of arguing about which is better, saying, okay, what do we, what can we learn from that? Then I can do, and I've done that personally. We used to have an open push hands on uh, weekends when I had a big school. We'd have a push hands weekend, and people would come in from different styles and learn tons. And I learned one of the things I learned made a huge difference in understanding what my teacher was trying to teach me. A guy came, a young stylist came in, and he said, "We'll do this," and it just every, everything clicked. And so I got. Instead of struggling through what my teacher was saying, I suddenly, it was like filling in the missing piece. And I got what he was saying all at once. Mm. And that really, you know, that kind of stuff, I think everyone can benefit. So I'm, I'm kind of reaching out and say, look, we've got to start being still with our, our rotations. And with Yang style, Yang and, and Wu, I just don't know enough about Wu Hao to to make any comment there but hmm. with Yang and Wu you can move you can move kind of linearly until you contact and then you rotate and that's you know that can be where your rotation is it doesn't you don't have to be like the practical method where everything's rotation all the way through all the time hmm. so anyway so it's just kind of reaching out and 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 seeing how we can preserve our art uh, collectively i think you were saying that you're in the process of starting a new school or starting to teach some people is that correct yeah I've, i had a student that sought me out and i'm going to start teaching classes here in probably january it's been put off a couple of times and uh things have to things are still a little bit up in the air on that right i have had a student he decided that he his fall is busy so he needed to he's he's a craftsman 
And for some reason, fall, I guess, going into Christmas is really busy. So he's he's working on exercises that I gave him uh, while he's while we're not meeting together. Right, we'll start meeting again in January, and hopefully, have, we'll have a new space to meet in. I've taught plenty in parks and garages and <laughs> backyards and, and stuff. Mm. Through. So, can you um just to let everyone know, like how you met your teacher? I think it's. Is it Joseph Chen? Yeah, Joseph Chen or Chen Zhenghua. I was studying with a, another young style teacher who kind of endorsed Joseph. And so I started communicating with Joseph. And so we got together on at a uh, Tai Chi Legacy in Dallas. At a, it's a tournament there. And uh, he was doing workshops and, and stuff. And I, I ended up spending the entire weekend with him and learn more in, in one weekend than I'd been doing Tai Chi for about 13 years. I did judo before that. And we just hit it off. We just, it just made a connection. It was clear that we were going to be, whether I continued with Tai Chi or not, I was, it, we were going to be lifelong friends. And then, so he, we started talking about how we could make the practical method grow. And so we kind of put together some plans and I hosted a few seminars. I was in Bentonville, Arkansas at that time and uh, hosted some seminars and those developed. A lot of the people that attended those became his disciples eventually. So it just kind of grew and grew, grew and pilled uh, and he's branched out worldwide now. Mm -hmm. um, and he is the official international standard bearer of Master uh, Hong's group there are a lot of teachers that are in China, but um, uh, most of them that come out of China kind of work with him and or teach. There are a few branches that are broken off. Mm -hmm. That was that was 1999. So Right. So, so oh, it's a while ago, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so like over 20 years, isn't it? Since yeah. you met him first time. Right. Yeah. So but I was going to say, without getting too controversial, <laughs> How would you describe the difference between Shen Village Tai Chi and Practical Method Tai Chi? So I've I haven't studied Shen Village, you know, other than you know what what's available online. I've the closest I got, I think it was Wang Xian was doing a just doing teaching basic silk reeling kind of things, and that's that's been the limit of my for an hour or something. So mm -hmm. that's to my Chen village, but I've done other branches of Tai Chi, mostly, I guess it mostly come through Chen, Chen Jiao Kui. So, okay, but to not hedge your question, ultimately there's not much difference, but at the beginning, there's superficial differences. For example, one of the problems Master Chen faced and I faced as a teacher is you get people who are shifting their their bodies left and right and 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 it just it's it's kind of a shortcut in teaching let me give an example if you're te if you're teaching you're doing a tai chi circle and you're teaching the inward part you come in and then you'd shift your hips and then you'd come out and yeah come and out. shift your hips forward so backwards and forwards sort of backwards and forwards and that's kind of that's kind of a lazy way to teach it and it but you kind of have to do it in a group because what really has to happen as you come in that shift has to be in your pelvis you can't be a weight shift it has to you have to shift substantial and insubstantial without shifting your weight right it's because you're and we we more or less stay 50 50. And you see that in the, in the in the Chin Village Advanced Practitioners, but you don't see it much in the, you see it a little bit in the West among the, the Chin Village um, practitioners here. But you, so you have to do that, that weight shifting back and forth and back and forth is the first big superficial thing that you see. The form is a little different in that Chin Zheng Hua, Asked to ask Chen Chen Fakur that if they could modify the form for him so that he just did the only practice the applications of the form rather than uh, there are some things that hide the applications, if you will, in the original Chen form. Hmm. And um, they're not very hidden, 
but they're a little hidden. Stylistic and, things, maybe. Yeah, just that sty- kind of stylistic things. Some of the spacing with the hands and stuff, like a lot of times they'll get big and wide like this, but this mm. needs to be on the wrist and this needs to be on, on the elbow. So this, you know, w- one hand needs to be on the wrist and one hand needs to be on the elbow. Yeah, so either you're fighting a giant or... Yeah, yeah, you, so you can't <laughs> have your hands four feet apart. Yeah, you know, yeah. they need to be you know, 18 inches apart or something like that. The little details like that. And so it's not, a, it's a little bit different. It's, it, it's not a lot different, but what it's been able to do for the students is you get right into how you really reinforces your push hands and, and then your basics and that, that work, those all work together synergistically. So as you're practicing basics, you're practicing form. As you're practicing form, you're practicing push hands. Rather than a little bit, there's no adjustment needed uh, as you move from one to the other. Mm. And that's that's the the big thing. When you get into some of the martial applications, you have to kind of go back to the original form a little bit, uh, rather than the rather you know, in the self defense applications, rather than in the control applications. Uh, that you learn in the as you're first learning the form and doing push hands, mm-hmm. and that's that's something I emphasize. It's not really emphasized in our system is that there are layers in the teaching, but most te- most Tai Chi teachers combine martial, like the first part of Tai Chi is te- learning to control yourself and learning to control your op- opponent. There's not really that much martial about it. You're trying to control them, not injure them. And then this, the the next layer is to injure is to learning to injure your opponent, and that's self defense. Now, if we go into sport fighting, you don't want to injure your opponent, so that's a little bit different to tra- trajectory. Mm. But um, but that line is really blurred. Uh, even my teacher, we've talked about it. People want to see the martial aspects of it, so he pulls in a little bit of that martial aspect which is not really what you want to teach beginners. It's what you want to teach them is control. Mm. That makes sense. What's the third level? <laughs> uh, third level would be weapons, probably. Right, okay, yeah. That's pretty, pretty normal for Tai Chi, isn't it? Weapons are the last thing, not the... I mean, everyone, everyone would agree thing. with that, but, but in practice, it's, it gets all jumbled up and blurred, and, and people... Yeah. People just barely learning the form are trying to go, okay, how do I use this as a martial art now? Mm. And it's like, uh, you don't really know how to use it yet as, as to control your opponent. And so it, it's not really wrestling, like it, like, uh, but it would be like not, not Chinese fast wrestling, but it would be, well, it's push hands. Yeah. Push hands in the Chen village that I've seen is very wrestling like. You know, it's, it's, it's much more wrestling than what I typically find in a, like a Yang style push hands class, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You get two extremes. And for me, it's like, <laughs> I've judged push hands com- uh, competitions, but I try to avoid the competitions because I don't want the competition. I don't want the winning to become the focus of my training, the investment, investment and loss or whatever you want to be able to, you want to learn. And if you learn, you win. If you're, you know, resorting to cheap tricks so that you can win, you're not learning. So I'm, I'm trying to learn what it is, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, Hong used to do, and, and Master Chen does it too, is that he would, he would be, they, people would be doing push hands and he'd say, freeze. And they would stop. And then he'd ask him, okay, what? what movement from the form are you doing and ask them each what they were doing. And, it, and they would, you know, <laughs> I'm sure most of the students would at first would go, uh, you know, yeah, I yeah. Don't, I'm not doing anything, you know, from the form and, and you go, then, you know, why are you not using the form to do this move? And, and they go, and so it was a kind of a discipline you know, discipline yourself to doing form movements, not just pushing randomly. And so there's a lot to be learned in that. I mean, you have a, you know, whole long form to experiment with and to to learn in, in push hands uh, at that level. And that's what I mean. Can you, 
can you, you know, I, I, just can't, I can't do it. I can't apply every movement in the form in a push method. I mean, that's, it's just a huge volume of, of knowledge. And it's not like you have to do everything, but you have to be proficient before you can move on. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm guessing with that, my, my teacher always said that the, the movements in the form were just examples, but there's almost infinite movements. So like the, the movements in the form weren't everything. You know, so you could be doing a movement in push hands that isn't in the form. Well, and and yes, that's true. If you look at the form in terms of techniques, there there would be a finite number of techniques. Hmm. But if you look at the uh, energies generated by the by the form, uh, I guess I guess that's a good way. The 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 skill developed by the form then yeah, you might be using the upper body from this part of the form and the lower body from that part of the form, which is not in the form, but they're, but independently they are. So you've, you've created something new and that's, that's, you know, a great place to be in your, in your learning. Yeah. Um, I mean, energetically, uh, I just use that word advisedly, but there's, there's typically thought of as eight energies and then there's five directions and, Everything yeah. can be, it's just a tool for analyzing a movement, isn't it? Like, you know, you could look at any movement you do and say it's just one of these eight, and then it's got a direction, which is one of the five. So, you know, it, it, you could say that, although this is movement doesn't appear in the form, this movement is actually, uh, I'm doing split and I'm doing it backwards, you know. Right, so, right, right. So it's one of the 13. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you, you're, you, you become very creative and and what you can do with the form but before you can do that you've got to get the basics down before you can and uh can do that yeah when i talk energies generally i'm talking potential or kinetic like physics yeah you mean yeah 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 and in an actual like a, a physics type of energy like there's a right. force yeah rather than i guess a lot of people would maybe the same directions Red or subtle energies. Some some people talk yeah. about. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm trying. I'm trying not to talk about magic energy here. I'm just yeah. talking about, yeah. um, like you know, like ward off is outwards and roll back is inwards. You know, and that that sort of that sort of level right. of things. And right. Split is split is two opposite directions. And then you get weird ones like elbow stroke, which is there like, are some weird. There's some weird. You can, the elbow. Some, <laughs> you can do some really weird stuff with Tai Chi. I mean, the first time I pushed hands with my teacher, with uh, Chen Zhenghua, I would, I was pushing with him, uh, I don't know, if, uh, a few seconds. And I swear that the, we were on, con- on a, in a parking lot, and I would swear that the, the pavement turned to glass or, or ice. And <laughs> my legs just went, and, and I had no way to interpret it other than it felt like I was falling on ice hmm. and, beca- and because I couldn't understand what was going on, you know, the, my perception. And then we pushed hands for a few more minutes and he did something, you know, he was being nice to me. <laughs> and, and then I felt the pavement buckle underneath me and then spring me up into the air. <laughs> and I was like, you know, like I was on a trampoline and yeah. I was like, <laughs> what was that you know did the did the pavement buckle and spring me up into the air no but i had no way in my perceptions in in uh, in my uh, experience to to do that now that i felt all that i can got, kind of go okay he's doing this and this and you know i can kind of understand what's go- what's going on but when i first made contact with him and and other and i'm you know, one of hundreds of people who have similar experience. Uh, he's had people go up, uh, push hands with him for a few minutes and go over and throw up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> their bodies just don't, you know, they they don't know what's going on. So they're like air sick or uh, yeah, something. Sick. motion sickness. Yeah, Motion sickness of some sort. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> what else? Anyway, so so there are some really strange things that, that can happen with Tai Chi that you you think wow you know one of the things when you apply tai chi correctly you feel like you don't you're not doing anything you're feeling like 
all I did was lift my arm and he flew across the room. And it's not because this leverage is there. It's because this is maybe a trigger to other other forces that are uh, kinetic forces that have been stored and this and lifting your arms, just the release, you know, mm. uh, and I said, kinetic, I meant potential or forces. That's the kind of the bow, the idea of storing energy in a bow and store and it, release. Yeah. Store and re- so things get stored, they get stored in, in your body, but they also get stored in the opponent's body. Mm. And then a lot of Tai Chi is just releasing that stored energy. Yeah, my teacher was very big on that. The idea that when you when you re- release energy, it's light le- it's, it's light letting go of the arrow. You know, if you've already pulled it back, right. all you have to do is let go. You don't have to you don't have to do anything else. You know. <laughs> yeah, so I I enjoy a little Chinese archery, and oh, yeah. and so they have you know a thumb hook, so it's a, a thumb ring, mm. and you you kind of look loop the string on that thumb ring. And you, you're basically holding it on there. And so you can't push it. You can't, you can, you could do some strange stuff, but all you have to do is just relax. Yeah. Let go. And that, <laughs> it's, it, there's a, all, everything, all that energy is released. So, so that really kind of brings home some of the stuff that you see on the, uh, or you read on, on storing and releasing energy. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the Tai Chi classics, are uh, written i think by people who use bows and arrows because they're, they're always talking about this analogy of storing releasing and and some of the posture names are things like bend the bow to shoot the tiger and all this stuff it was it, i think it was such a part of the culture that these things came out of it's very interesting that you've done some or you were still doing chinese archery how did you find that i just got online there's some great there's some great groups on uh on facebook Mm-hmm. And um, some really knowledgeable, knowledgeable people. So Chinese archery, Manchu archery, if someone wants to wants to pursue that. And then I just got a bow and an arrow and some made some targets and and did some of the traditional training. Followed some of the traditional training methods. There's mm-hmm. also a really good book. I don't don't remember the author's names right off uh, hand, but they did. A, a lot of research into primarily Ming Dynasty archery methods, get a little bit of Qing. And so there are some standards there, and that's something that was on the brink of, of loss. But the, the demand, they've revived bow building in, in China. Uh, they'll even, uh, people get Chinese armor, like an archer would wear, or a, a, a mounted soldier would wear. And uh, and uh, so have some, you know, kind of like cosplay, you know, at, yeah, but, yeah. but to but also to uh, feel the weight and and to understand the the dynamics of what's going on. It's pretty pretty interesting stuff. And people, I just like to hit the targets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's interesting that the like how strong you have to be to bend those bows as well, and how you have to use certain body mechanics to draw the. The string you can't you can't just grab it and pull because nope. these, these things are like they're 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 tough aren't they like you know yeah you, you don't want to start there but <laughs> yeah. yeah you want to build up you know like like uh any kind of physical exertion you want to to build up that strength and make the tendons a little more dense and and uh everything and get a few more mitochondria in there to get that energy in there but yeah. uh so you build, you build up, and but a lot of a lot of the guys, um, I think it's, I think one of the authors is Justin Ma. I think that's right. He's he's built up, so, and some of his people that are kind of follow following his methods have built up to you know I thought seventy pounds was pretty good, and but they're getting hundred hundred and fifty pounds. Yeah, uh, that's that's a hell of a like. Yeah, deal. that that's a <laughs> lot of weight to be holding, and then you get the either Manchu bows or um, or even some of the Qing bows, I'm mean, sorry, the Ming bows, they have fixed the ears, the ends, that uh, are like a, they don't bend. Design of the bow actually gives them a, a kind of a slow start and then uh, really kicks in the power. So they're able to shoot really heavy arrows. And so you get a lot of force on impact. 
Yeah, and, it's that recursive design, isn't it, of the bow as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the, the bow design is super interesting, um, and the way it's developed throughout through the years. Whether they have a uh, little short uh, saya or uh, ears on the ends of the bows, or really long ones, it's, it's been a it's it's been interesting to how they've developed and uh, whether or not the one the bow that I've got doesn't actually have the string bridges, so you don't get that two stage. You don't get that two two stage power. It's it's just more like a a one stage, but it's got big long levers on the end pulling the ring part of the bow. And, really. and do you find a sort of correlation between Tai Chi and the archery at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot. A little bit in the focus, a little bit in the stances. The stances is not one because you're not straight-legged, but you're not at sitting as much as you would be in, in, in any kind of Tai Chi action. Mm. Uh, and you tend to lean forward a little bit to be able to – kind of put your head over your arrow and your make room for the bow if it uh, if that makes sense uh, if you're upright the bow has no room to to right to, yeah your to, chest is in the way sort of thing yeah and the your arrow is on the right side if you're left uh, if you're right-handed your arrow's on the right side where western it's on the left so you're holding it on there so there's a little bit different when the bow releases it tends to flip the bow outward away from the body where you have to wear an arm guard in Western because it flips in against the arm Mm. releases. So, um, you know, and they have, you know, modern bows have all this, you know, where you're shooting right down the center to minimize that and all that kind of stuff. But modern bows have all these fancy telescopic sort of sights on them, don't they? Uh, (laughs) Crazy, crazy stuff. Modern bow. I like the, primitive and uh one one thing that's kind of different uh, or similar with tai chi is kind of the expansion through the body out to the mm. instead of trying to pull individual muscles you know like squeezing that shoulder blade back a little bit it's more like getting the big picture and and getting everything working together rather than trying to focus on one muscle working harder to get it to you know, to help it reach its goal yeah. yeah. Well, I think we've been chatting for about an hour. It's been a fascinating conversation. Okay. Where do people find you if they want to get in touch? Oh, I don't have really good in, uh, contact information right now. I've been kind of laying low. I'm two circles 13 on the Rum Soak Fist forum. Oh, you yeah. Could, that... you, you could PM, <laughs> you could private message me there. It's a meeting um, of great minds, isn't it, that place? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I guess you could contact me on Facebook. It's Richard Johnson Taiji Tuan, my Taiji pseudonym. And that would be a, you could PM me there. Yeah, cool. So if you want to join um, join your upcoming maybe class. Well, it's, there, there's going to be a class. It's maybe is where it's going to be. So right. <laughs> getting enough students is, is another thing, but. But it's somewhere near Alabama, right? <laughs> so I'm in North Alabama. I'm the, in the Decatur Huntsville area. Right. And we're looking at putting classes in, in a town called Madison. So. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's been great finally meeting you and poking around in your brain a little. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, I hope it was informative to for you and your listeners. Yeah, well. great. Thank you very much. Well, good luck to you. Find out more about the Tai Chi Notebook podcast at www.thetaichinotebook.com.